Thanks, thank Giovanni. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I have no disclosures. Uh, type 2 endoleaks are typically uh, endoleaks that are uh, as a result of branches that are remaining on the aneurysm sac. The flow now becomes retrograde back into that aneurysm sac and then can lead to perfusion and uh, ultimately pressurization of the sac. Historically, the rate of uh, type 2 endoleaks uh, right after the EVAR procedure at one month is typically about 15 to 20 percent. At one year, that rate will decrease to about 8 to 12 percent, and so you see the natural uh, course is, uh, is of resolution of these endoleaks. However, we do know that if these leaks persist, especially greater than 6 to 12 months, those leaks will have a much lower rate of spontaneous resolution. The question then is why do anything? Well, if you were to measure the pressure of every single one of these type 2 endoleaks, you would find that several of them do actually have systemic pressure. And we do know that by uh, reports that uh, some of these type 2 endoleaks do actually uh, end up with a rupture of the aneurysm sac, and it's probably those uh, type 2s that have systemic pressure and ultimately lead to sac uh, enlargement. I think most people would use this type of algorithm when managing type 2 endoleaks. The first thing to do, obviously, is to confirm that it actually is a type 2 endoleak and not a type 1 or a type 3. If it's early, we just follow it. If it's out past six months, if there's uh, evidence of sac stabilization or shrinkage, then we typically would follow it. If there's sac enlargement or if for some reason we, there is a pressure uh, that's obtained and that's high, then we would probably most likely move forward with some type of treatment. The question is how to intervene. Uh, there are really three methods uh, to try to embolize these leaks, either a transarterial, a translumbar, or a transcaval approach. The transarterial uh, is via the collateral pathway. So in the, in the case of the IMA as a feeding vessel, it's uh, coming through the uh, SMA, the marginal artery drum, and then back into the IMA. If it's lumbars, oftentimes it's through the iliolumbar collateral pathway. The translumbar technique, as uh, Dr. Maida was uh, very nicely showed, uh, is via the uh, posterior aspect and to come directly into the sac and then embolize the nidus of the, of the leak. And the transcaval is a newer technology that uh, entails coming through the venous system, through the IVC, and then into the sac. So translumbar access started gaining popularity in the early 2000s when people were dissatisfied with the results of transarterial embolization. You can see in this paper the results of the translumbar approach had significantly better results than that of the transarterial techniques. And in this paper, they look at the different types of complications. You can see translumbar, it was a, a, a meta-analysis of different papers and a review, and, and you can see that the rates of complications with translumbar were much less in these published series as compared to that of transarterial, and that probably has something to do with not needing to come through all these collateral pathways, which can obviously lead to some type of complication. The technique is pretty straightforward. It can uh, initially was done with uh, CT guidance, really can just be done with fluoroscopic guidance and looking, looking at anatomic landmarks. You come posterior, uh, left of the spine, directly access that sac, and then uh, get to the nidus of the endoleak and typically endo embolize the nidus as well as the feeding vessel. But there are complications that can be associated with this. One of the largest complications is actually infection. There are reports of, of uh, not only sac infection, but endograft infection after translumbar, and then uh, um, uh, anatomic uh, uh, adjacent structures that can get infected as well. And then misplaced coils can occur as well in that posterior uh, approach. It can be somewhat difficult sometimes to, uh, to see exactly where you are. Um, and in some situations, the interventionalists may think that they're actually in the sac, but really in the retroperitoneum, and the coils can be deposited in the retroperitoneum, obviously, to no avail for uh, treating the uh, type 2 endoleak. Interestingly, uh, with, with applying some of the newer ideas to the transarterial approach, that is not only uh, embolizing the feeding vessel, but the nidus of the leak as well, when you look at this uh, most recent publication, the results of transarterial modified embolization are uh, as good, if not better, than the translumbar technique. And so I think uh, the, the, it's not necessarily the, the access technique uh, per se, as well as much as it is to uh, really get the leak, uh, uh, the feeding vessel, as well as the site of which it uh, enters the sac. In terms of the transcaval approach, the procedure is uh, pretty straightforward. You come in from the common femoral vein. We typically access this with a nine French sheath. We use a 19 gauge transliver biopsy needle. We obtain AP and lateral views and then use microcatheter selection of the endoleak branch, embolization of the endoleak uh, in the sac. The benefits are that the patient's supine, so it's much more comfortable. Access is very simple. You can have concomitant arterial access to allow you to have aortograms and angiograms. And then obviously you have direct sac access, which uh, gives some benefits uh, uh, as uh, shown in that translumbar uh, um, 
uh, slides. So these are uh, two examples of a good and poor candidate. You can see uh, the good candidate, the IVC, is opposed right next to that aneurysm sac. In this situation, this, the end leak is actually right there. On the poor candidate, you can see the IVC is not even connected or not even attached or adjacent, immediately adjacent to the sac. In addition, the limbs are right there, so there's a higher risk of potentially injuring the endograft uh, when puncturing through. So just to show you a couple videos of how we typically do this, we start with a uh, venogram, and you can see the concavity into the IVC. That's basically the sac pushing into the IVC. That helps you uh, determine where you should be puncturing, in addition to anatomic landmarks identified on your CT scan. This is just a uh, slide of fluoroscopy of the uh, actual puncture. So you can see we're coming in with our 19-gauge uh, liver biopsy needle. And you can see we're pushing through. You can see it advanced all of a sudden, and that's when we get through the cava into the sac. When we think we're in the sac, we then advance with a uh, wire to gain access, and then we'll switch for a sheath to do uh, angiograms. Uh, with our uh, sheath in the sac, we do an aortogram in a lateral position, and you can see uh, the endoleak filling near the bottom of the screen there by the sheath, and you can see the feeding lumbar vessels as well. And then using microcatheters, we directly select that nidus uh, and bring our catheters right there, and we inject, again, confirming that endo leak. Coils are then pl placed within there. In this patient, we were unable to get into the feeding vessel, but we placed the coils at the nidus. And then a uh, completion arteriogram uh, demonstrates a resolution of that type 2 endo leak, as you can see here. In our final move, we do a cavagram just to make sure there's no extravasation. There never is, uh, but just to be sure, uh, we do a cavagram. In our, in our series, uh, we looked at uh, uh, this was uh, we looked at this about six months ago. We had uh, nine patients at that point. All of these patients had had prior uh, attempts at uh, embolization with uh, further type two endo leaks. Were then referred for uh, uh, further treatment and management. You can see after transcaval embolization, the sacs were either stable or shrunk uh, subsequently. And in this paper, they looked at transcaval embolization as well. Very high technical success rate. Unfortunately, over time, you can see that the uh, recurrence rates uh, uh, start to uh, arise and uh, overall success rates uh, begin to uh, uh, mimic that of translumbar and even modify transarterial. So in conclusion, type 2 endoleaks do, uh, may need to intervention. The majority of them do not. Uh, endoleak access should be tailored to the patient in the leak. I think ultimately the, um, the results of transcaval, translumbar, and transarterial are probably all similar if done for the right patient, but you have to figure out what's the right access uh, approach for the uh, particular anatomy and the particular patient. Thank you.